6th of June 2019, we are here in London with my good friend JC Parrots, who is um, who just got married. Congratulations! Thank you so much for your um, for your marriage, uh, for the wedding. And um, I heard you had a lovely uh, honeymoon. We did uh, the first time that we ever went to Greece. We went to Santorini. We went to Mykonos. We went to Naxos, and it is uh, it's definitely might be our favorite country in the world right now, depending on uh, where you catch me. We hope so. We also had um, because before um, JC was doing a presentation here at the uh, London chapter, but he also did one a couple of days ago in Athens, and we yeah. had very very good feedback. He's an excellent speaker. So here we are here today to meet the man behind the charts. So my first question, JC, is how did you first go acquainted with uh, technical analysis and um, how did you first, you know, what's your first look at the chart? Yeah, you know, Alex, the truth is it, it really came out of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, I tried other forms of analysis and they simply did not work. I, did, I just didn't understand, you know, I, conceptually putting a value on a company. I can understand that. Um, but then the market needs to agree with your valuation. And in many cases, the market does not agree with what many of us think. So rather than try to force my opinion on the market, it just seems to make a lot more sense. And clearly we've had a lot more success since then by just l taking what the market is giving us and interpreting that itself, right? So instead of forcing our opinion on the market, let the market show us what it thinks and then we'll take advantage of it. And really the, the simple fact that markets trend, um, Isaac Newton said, right, um, uh, an object in motion stays, it tends to stay in motion. That's the way that markets are. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna identify the direction of the primary trend and just that one little simple step increases our probabilities of success right off the bat, just being on the right side of the trend. And, and that's really it. And then, you know, there's an old saying that fundamentals tell you what to buy, technicals tell you when to buy. I think that's the biggest lie on Wall Street. It, it's the technicals that tell you what to buy. And you don't have to be an expert in energy or in a technology or in biotechnology. I don't know anything about any of those things. As a technician, we're able to buy and sell securities in any sector, in any country in the entire world, because we only care about the direction of price. Um, and then if it's energy, great. And if it's healthcare, terrific. And if it's a bank, awesome. You don't have to be an expert in any one field. And I really like that a lot. So now that we um, talk about so many sectors, uh, the sectors that you mentioned, what did you tell us a bit about your um uh, all-star charts and what you do, what kind, first of all, what type of analysis you do, uh, which is your primary uh, clientele, and how do you spend your day at all-star charts? So all-star charts really just started as a blog, um, kind of just like a journal, you know, it was early in the financial blogosphere. Um, I don't know if I was the first technical analysis blog, but I was probably one of the first ones. I think there may have been a few others at the time. And it was just a way to put my ideas down on paper. Nobody was reading it. I didn't expect anybody to read it. Who's going to read this humble blog, um, you know, written by a, I guess I was a CMT already for a chartered market technician for maybe three or four years at that time, this was 2010, um, and then very quickly, people found it all over the world, and I was able to see the traffic, and we're getting all this traffic from India, and Australia, and London, and all over Europe, all over South America, you know, in America, of course, you know, New York, Chicago, because I was able to see the traffic and where it was coming from, and it was fascinating, like, where are these people finding um, all of this information, and then all of a sudden, Bloomberg starts calling me, hey, GC, come on TV, CNBC, hey, GC, come host Fast Money, you know, uh, uh, BNN in Canada, um, uh, Fox Business is calling me, um, CNN Money, and just some networks I hadn't even heard of yet in India, JC, come talk about your charts. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And you know, the, the, what was really fascinating about that is that I was able to meet so many people you know, behind the scenes, um, understand the way the, the production worked in financial media. Uh, it really helped me understand um, some of the uh, problems and some of the conflicts of interest with financial media that I didn't quite understand at the time. You know, I thought financial media was there to help the consumer. You know, now I, I chuckle at that. You know, they, it couldn't be, it's, it's poison. Um, but it was just 
such a great experience and I owe that to the blog for sure. And then, you know, it was just a journal, you know, hey, I'm looking at financials, look at very interesting, oh, look at consumer cyclicals, you know, interesting, look at crude oil, just the things that I'm watching, no big deal. And, um, you know, people from around the world start, you know, JC, how come you don't have like an official research product? Um, I would love to see that. These are some of the biggest hedge funds and banks in the world, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, okay, sure, you know, I'm doing the work anyway. If nobody buys it, I, I, I still have to do the work cool. and then maybe I'll, I'll make a, a, a few bucks. And that quickly turned into a, a very large uh, research company, um, and now you know we we employ uh, uh, several analysts, and um, you know we're creating jobs. And um, at this point, you know pretty much every major bank in America, um, you know we work for them. Um, some of the biggest hedge funds in the world that I learned from, you know that I read about in, in uh, Market Wizards and stuff like that, they're our clients now, and and they pay me to help them, I should be paying them for the conversations that I'm having. Um, so it, it really is uh, funny and uh, it's just uh, amazing the experiences that I get simply by having the conversations that I have with some of the smartest and most successful traders of all time. Um, and I'm just incredibly blessed and I pinch myself every day is really what I do. And I try not to take it for granted. I try to just stay humble, keep my head down and, and work hard and, and, and just try to put out good work. Um, as part of that work, what would you consider the most challenging aspect of it? What is the, the most difficult part of your, your daily uh, routines? Um, probably disconnecting. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to do for work what I do for fun, you know, and, and I've noticed that many people around the world don't have that opportunity. I get up in the work in the morning excited, you know, to go to work, you know, Sunday night I'm excited for Monday. Uh, on Saturday mornings, rather than drink my coffee and read the newspaper, I drink my coffee and look at international markets on Saturday morning, you know, all the weekly charts. It's really what I enjoy doing. So the most challenging part that I have found over the years is turning it off, you know, because I have my office at home, so I can, like, I'm there watching a movie, and I think of something, and I was like, oh, let me go, let me go pull up that chart, see if my theory is correct, or whatever, um, so, you know, one thing that I have done to help me disconnect is try to learn about other things that have nothing to do with the markets, um, and that has been, you know, I've, I've been learning about wine, right, I'm studying for my certified sommelier exam, and just learning about the geography, and the history, and the art and the science of winemaking just helps me completely disconnect from the market. And, you know, I've had this conversation with other friends of mine, you know, Barry Ritholtz, him and his wife are taking ballroom dance lessons. Um, I just, so continuing to learn about other things that have nothing to do with the market, I have found uh, very, very helpful. You've also managed my, one of my next questions was, what do you do for fun? But then you, is there, so okay, well, we'll go ahead with it. What else do you, what else do you do for fun? I mean, you mentioned about wine. Yeah. Do you do any sports or what other activities do you do to disengage? Yeah. Help you get your mind off of trading? Well, I was a baseball player my whole life. All right. Um, at this point, baseball, uh, you know, between my elbow and my shoulder, just, you know, at this point, baseball is probably not the best thing for me to do. Um, I like running because I get to listen to podcasts okay. while I run. Um, I like, uh, I we have I, two blocks from my house, there's a boxing gym, so I enjoy doing the boxing, and I've been getting, I've, I've lived in California for four years, so when I moved to California, I said, okay, I'm going to do California things. I'm going to garden, uh, I'm going to start doing yoga, so I really, really do like the yoga, and I've been getting more and more into that, um, and then I'm very lucky that I married the most beautiful girl in the world, so spending time with her and um, traveling and exploring new parts of California, or more recently, Greece, we went to Naxos and Mykonos and Santorini, and it was just so amazing, so spending time with her is, uh, is one of my favorite things to do, that's right. Perfect. Um, now, let's sh switch back to markets. Um, what are your favorite tools and techniques from uh, technical analysis? So I think the most important tool in technical analysis is price, right? That is, that's it. Everything else after price is supplemental, you know? And, and I think that that gets, you know, 
easily mistaken. People are like, oh, I tested this tool, technical analysis doesn't work, I back tested that, it doesn't work. It's like you're completely missing what we're doing here. We're analyzing price. Anything after that is just a supplement to help identify the direction of the primary trend and more importantly, manage risk responsibly. You know, that's really where technical analysis comes in. So price is my number one indicator by far and away. And then a far, 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 far second, um, I use uh, a momentum indicator. I prefer a relative strength index, an RSI, a 14 period RSI. And, um, and I use relative strength. You know, I compare sectors to the overall market. I compare specific uh, emerging markets, like a, maybe let's say India, I compare it to the rest of emerging markets. You know, um, I compare uh, stocks within a group to the others, right? So um, for example, healthcare. Healthcare is a very wide spectrum. You have biotechnology, you have pharmaceuticals, you have uh, medical equipment stocks, right? So I'll compare the industry groups within the same sector to one another. So if healthcare is breaking out to new highs, it's like, okay, is it pharma leading it or is it medical equipment stocks leading it, right? So I, we try to break it down and with my, you know, consistent, because I'm always talking with asset allocators, right? That's what I do for a living. I speak to people who put a lot of money to work and the common denominator between all of them, other than the risk management, of course, is really two things. It's momentum and relative strength. That's what they're looking for. So... Uh, that's what I focus on too. That's what I find the most helpful. And it seems to be that the smartest players on the street also find it incredibly helpful. Um, let's do some time traveling now. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> me too. Me too. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sort of like the opportunity to do so twice actually. The first one is if you could go back in time and change one call that you made which one would it be and what kind of wisdom did you get out of it and you know, share it with uh, the people who will be watching the interview? It's a great question. Um, in, at the end of 2010, I drank the Kool-Aid in uranium. Ah. Uranium's the next energy, blah, blah, blah. I'm in. So I started buying CCJ. Um, there was another one, there was a little one, UEC, I think it was. Um, there was an uh, ETF, I think it still exists, URA, it was a uranium ETF. And I was locked in. And it was breaking out, uptrends, beautiful thing. But the mistake that I made, this is in 2010, this is almost a decade ago, I didn't have an exit strategy. I drank the Kool-Aid, I was in. Yeah. There was no plan. And there was a tsunami after an earthquake that hit Fukushima in Japan, if you recall. And there was a nuclear power plant melted down. And I, believe, I think that was a Friday maybe. And these uranium stocks got killed, right? And I'm like, oh, it's just because of the earthquake, it'll come back. It's almost 10 years later, they still haven't come back. Yeah. So what did I learn? Have a plan. And there has to be a, a price between where you buy a stock and zero, where you say, I got it wrong, it's time to move on. And fortunately, I didn't have that much money at the time. So what I did lose, it, it may have hurt, but now in hindsight, it wasn't the end of the world. Um, and it taught me a very good lesson. There's some lessons that you have to learn the hard way. And boy, did I learn that one the hard way. That's good, yeah, life's, life's experience is always very, very useful. Um, if someone asked you, okay, um, recommend two or three books which ones would it, would it be in technical analysis? I know that you know, we have a very a large a plethora of selections and yeah. of people like it from different reasons. Which books would you recommend and for which reason? You know, the Bible of technical analysis, Edwards and McGee, you have to read it. Read it five times. Read it, start again, read it again. Go on vacation, forget about it, come back, read it again, right? Um, no question. I think uh, the Market Wizards books by Jack Schwager, mm -hmm. he interviews the best traders in the world and they all have different strategies. But the one common denominator between all of them is risk management. And like I said, the Edwards and McGee read it five times. Some of the best traders I know read the Market Wizards books every year and they've been reading it every year for decades to just remind you Risk management, risk management, risk management. It's not about the strategies. They all have different strategies. It's the risk management. And they all manage risk in different ways. 
which I find really interesting. And I have built my risk management strategies based on the, the, the collection that I've gotten from the best traders in the world and the way that they manage risk. I've taken a little bit from a lot of them and built my own strategies. And, um, you know, honestly, if you read the market, because it's not just one, there's like the original market wizards, then there's the market wizards of hedge funds. There's like three or four of them, right? Read them all. Uh, so you, let's. Um, so you talked about risk manager. I'm just picking words from from your replies. And so can you just very briefly talk about your approach or your understanding of risk management? So there's, it's about finding a balance. So if you put your stop losses too tight, you're increasing the likelihood of a whipsaw, right? Getting stopped out, and then right. If you are putting your stop losses too far away, then there's more risk at hand. So the closer your stop losses, the better the risk versus reward might be. And on paper, you could be like, oh, it's 30 to one, you know, reward to risk. But your stop is so tight that you're almost setting yourself up to failure. And there's no right or wrong answer. In, in Greece and Athens, as a matter of fact, somebody asked me, what is the ideal risk versus reward? Is it four to one? Is it seven to one? Is it two to one? And the, and the answer is that it's different for everyone. And that's something that you need to think about yourself. And that's going to depend on your time horizon, your uh, risk tolerance, um, your overall market objectives. Why are you in the market? Um, you know, that's really what it is. And I think that my, my answer is going to be different from yours. It's going to be different for right? Everyone's going to have a different answer. So I think that before you ever enter your first trade ever, you need to decide that. Why am I here? Who are, yeah, yeah. Who are you? Why are you here? Correct. Right? So that's how I look at that. And my last question, because we are looking, really looking forward to your presentation. Again, going back to time traveling. If you could call up 25-year-old JC, what would you tell him? What would you advise him? As the great Socrates once said, all that I know is that I know nothing. And with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you very, very much. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. This is Alex Pirogu with JC Paretz from uh, London. Wishing you having a good afternoon. Thank you.